Namaste. Today I'm going to talk to you about how India's civil services are colonized. They are colonized from the very beginning of a person's career. The nature of the exam they have to pass is based on old social theories, colonial social theories, leftist Marxist social theories of guilt and what's wrong with us as a nation, a very sort of negative, depressing kind of an exam they have to pass and get their marks based on quoting depressing negative characters, anti-national characters. I'll give you plenty of examples. I'm making the claim that we need to decolonize India's civil services. Now, the exam, I want to show you uh, a slide uh, that uh, will tell you uh, what has to happen. Uh, at the top of the slide, the civil service exam has to be passed. Uh, at the bottom of the slide are young applicants. So these are in blue. In between, I have three things that I want to talk about. There is a syllabus uh, which is controlled by the, the UPSC, which is the exam body, the body that uh, actually conducts this exam, sets the syllabus and brings in all civil servants. Indian Foreign Service diplomats are hired this way. Uh, administrative services, police services, tax and audit and account services, all kinds of government bureaucrats, the people who run the country, the central government are recruited this way from, the, er, from an early age. So the, uh, the exam, uh, most recently I'm told uh, over a million young people took this exam. Yeah, that's twice as many people as the number of people sitting for the GRE exam, uh, which is meant for getting into United States graduate school. Uh, so I'm comparing uh, a kind of a prominent exam after undergraduate. In India, a very prestigious thing is to sit for this exam to get into the government service and in the United States to get into graduate school, a sort of equivalent. But it's twice as many uh, sitting for this exam in India, which is just, uh, it's not a comparison that makes any sense other than to tell you that it's a very large scale thing. There are over 2,000 centers around India where the, this exam is conducted and uh, in over 60 cities. Now what I want you to see in this slide is that the syllabus is just a syllabus. It's a 100 plus page PDF book that I went through. Uh, but then to actually give substance to the material which students have to pass, there are ideological writers. There are people who are well-known left-wing ideological writers from the past few decades and well-known uh, newspapers and publishing houses who supply this material with a certain ideological bent of mind. It is this material which I've, I've called B. A is the syllabus. B is the actual written material with ide ideologues produced. It's not produced by the government. Uh, and C are the coaching schools that the young people often go to. Uh, there are hundreds of these coaching schools all over India and these coaching schools are basically using the material produced by these ideological writers to train young people on how to pass the exam. So this is the structure I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about. There's a committee uh, by, the, by the government that developed this syllabus. So even so many years into the BJP government, it's a shame that things are the way they are and I will give you concrete examples. I'm going to, I'm going to analyze the syllabus, then I'm going to give you examples of actual courses being taught by these coaches. Uh, they are quoting Sheldon Pollock, uh, they are quoting uh, Ramira Thapar, uh, their expert, favorite expert to talk about is Ananya Vajpai. Uh, so, I'll give you those examples and I have video clippings and slides to animate this discussion, otherwise it would be a very heavy, boring discussion. It's a long talk, but it's a very important one that you should listen to because this is controlling how our country is being managed by the civil services. So when you run into civil services people, especially from the old guard, this will tell you why they are thinking the way they are thinking. And the fact that we are still now in 2017. Uh, using this syllabus and using this kind of training uh, is quite a shame. So let's get, uh, get, get on with this. Uh, I want to show you slides about the social sciences and humanities. I don't have a problem with the people who enter the physics, math, chemistry, engineering kind of exams because those are not uh, culturally biased. Let's go through some of the main subjects in the social sciences 
and I will quote from the official government syllabus required to be a civil servant, what you must know. So anthropology, uh, here is a quote from the actual syllabus. It wants you to know this thing, race and racism, biological basis of morphological variation of non-metric and characters, racial criteria, racial traits in relation to heredity and environment, biological basis of racial classification, racial differentiation and race crossing in man. Now my main, my overall impression of the anthropology curriculum is, is probably the worst bias that I've seen of, of a Western kind. You know, I want you people to know. I want, I want to talk in general now. Anthropology started during the era of colonialism when the West was coming across uh, primitive tribes and primitive people in various continents from the Americas, Africa, Asia and they wanted to understand who these people are. They are so different, we have to conquer them, we have to rule over them, we have to trade with them, so we must know who they are. So this led to a field of anthropology where people would go and you know become friends, learn to wear their clothes, learn to eat their food and, and uh, understand their language, but it's a one-way street, it's the western lens or drishti to see other people and to map them in the western representation. Generally, West is superior, they are inferior and, and so on and so forth. So the whole field of anthropology has from the very beginning been tainted in this kind of a racist manner. Recently, Western anthropologists or at least some of them have been reflecting and criticizing their own field and trying to do away with these things. In fact, they are against the idea of race. But here in India, we are still following the old anthropology school. So this is kind of interesting. Now these are the theories written in the syllabus. I, I, I'm not picking only a few topics out of many. The A through J are the topics listed in exactly this order, exactly this uh, vocabulary. Now, if you look at it, if you look at the, some of these terms, you know, you won't know what is going on. An average Indian who thinks he understands Indian society will not relate to this. So we are foreigners in the way our own subject is being, uh, uh, in the way we are being profiled, the way we are being studied. In look in parentheses, there's not a single Indian there. These are names unfamiliar to 99.9% .9 of people of India. So if we are being studied uh, by these weird, strange European theories, based on the expertise of these strange, unknown, alien people to us. It's quite a tragedy. Why don't we have our own theories on who we are, our own exemplars on who we are, our own drishti telling us who we are? So if you actually, if you look at uh, some of, many of these I know, many of these uh, uh, scholars of the West I have studied, and there's so much you can argue against. So it's so loaded with bias, wrong assumptions, false translations, prejudices from their own point of view and these people have been criticized in the West also. But in India it's sort of like a Bible, you know, what the West has given us becomes something non-violable, we follow it like obedient servants. So this is kind of a, a, a serious problem for me. Let's move on. Psychology. Now the psychology is a quite a disgusting approach in, the, in India because the Indian pioneering theories of mind are missing. We are not teaching Patanjali's idea of mind or Kashmir Shaivism or the yogi, yogi ideas, Buddhist ideas, Madhyamika ideas, Tantric ideas, you name it. We have many theories of mind, many theories of the nature of the self, the nature of the person. And guess what? The cutting edge of neuroscience research in the West and cognitive science research in the West is using Indian models, studying yogis and meditators, to develop the next generation of theories and we instead of being the pioneers in reviving our own traditional theories and not letting the West sort of take them away, we in fact are copying old Western theories of mind. This is, it is such a, such a strange thing, uh, you know, and I'm reminded of, a, I want to tell you a story. In 2002, IIT Kharagpur wanted to celebrate its 50th anniversary and they wanted to have many conferences on various disciplines. They applied for a grant from my Infinity Foundation to fund some conference. I looked at the list of conferences. I found the one called Mind Sciences to be very interesting. So I wrote to them saying, I would like to sponsor Mind Sciences, send me the, the, the list of speakers and topics. What they sent me was 100% Western. 
There was no Indian theory of mind. It was all fashionable Western theories, some of them quite obsolete, and speakers who were expert in those theories. So I sent back a note saying, I will sponsor this conference on the condition there should be at least one panel on Indian ideas of mind. And I got this nasty note saying, we are not chauvinists, we are not saffron, we are scientific people, we, only be, we don't believe in all this kind of stuff, you know. A very kind of a pejorative view of Indian ideas. So I took it to four or five of my white American uh, friends who are scholars of Indian theories of mind. And I said, please, you submit a proposal uh, that about Indian theories of mind, which is what you are borrowing and teaching and practicing. So be, be, this is your time to pay back. So there was a Buddhist, uh, Robert Thurman, he wrote uh, an abstract on uh, Buddhist theories of mind, how they're at the cutting edge. There was one scholar in Cambridge, uh, a, a Western scholar, he wrote on Patanjali's Yoga Sutra th theory of mind. Somebody else wrote on Sri Aurobindo, somebody else wrote on Kundalini. So the, I got a collection of these proposals and I sent it to the IIT Kharagpur people and immediately they accepted them because now it's white people saying it. You see, after all, we have an inferiority complex, but if it's white people saying it, it must be okay. So these people were sent to do a panel uh, in that conference. We sponsored it and they got standing ovations. Indians loved it. The Indians love to hear good things about themselves provided it's being said by Westerners. So we started a whole movement called Indian Theories of Mind. And for about 10 years, we were funding conferences every year. We, we had conferences in Pondicherry, in uh, Kerala, in various places, finally in Delhi. Uh, and we cre there was a, there's a whole group called uh, a group of uh, uh, psychology professors in India who meet uh, once a year or so. And I've given addresses two, three times in Delhi University, for example. And they, they specialize in Indian theories of psychology. So over the past, I would say 15 years, a, an Indian theories of psychology movement has started. I am so disappointed that the people who, who make the syllabus of the UPSC, the exam body for Indian civil services, has not a single line in that syllabus concerning Indian theories of mind. A very sad state for India considering we've been uh, supposedly uh, independent for 70 years. Let's move on. Political theory and Indian politics in the syllabus, they talk about theories of state. So all these are Western categories, liberal, neoliberal, Marxist, pluralist, post colonial. I mean, these are Western theories. And so what happens is an Indian has to start memorizing, mugging up to impress the exam that he understands the Western theories. And they have to all outdo each other, do name dropping on who knows more. See, concept of justice. Uh, concept of justice is with reference to Western thinkers, it says in the syllabus. The idea of equality, the idea and affirmative action, again Western. Rights. Now when they talk about rights, dharma is also about responsibilities. It's not what's my right to get this, to get that, but what's my responsibility towards family, towards community, towards animals, towards nature, is my responsibility towards various things, various people and, 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 and beings. That is missing from the syllabus. The whole, the whole bias is the way the West would see political thought. So this is, uh, this is another example. Then when you, when you talk about, when they talk about in the syllabus uh, Indian politics, uh, it's, it's uh, nothing about Indian classical times or, or India's own indigenous uh, you know, ideas of politics. Look at the political ideologies they've listed. Liberalism, socialism, Marxism, fascism, Gandhism and feminism. So other than Gandhism, you know, which is sort of an interruption between various Western models of uh, politics, everything else is important. And this is what the young students are expected to memorize and regurgitate in these exams in order to become civil servants. Then the government, uh, under government, Indian government, it's as if there was no such thing as, a, as governance until, our, until the British. It's only the modern state that is uh, covered. As if India, the notion of India starts in the modern era and you know, a, a pre-modern India is something not even worth talking about. But what about the governance of traditional kings? What about the written, what about the Dharma Shastras, the Artha Shastras? What about the Mahabharata? What about the notion of Bharat as a, as a, as a nation? 
uh, as a people with governance. I mean, those people were not some bunch of, uh, you know, uh, wild people without uh, uh, the notion of a state and a, and a nation and uh, uh, ideas of community and justice and law and order and things of that sort. So, the UPSC exam seems to ignore all of that. Then, then there is uh, international politics. Now, in international politics, it's correct, they talk about globalization, uh, responses from developed and developing societies, but they ignore the challenges to Western globalization. It seems that the idea of globalization is still in the era of Western globalization. The UPSC exam people have not woken up to the idea that now there is a Chinese view of globalization and there is a pan-Islamic view of globalization. In fact, there are multiple rival views of globalization. And then it, it, under the heading methodologies in the study of international relations, it talks about idealist, realist, Marxist, functionalist and systems theory. Now, who in India would even have heard of these things unless you go for one of these exams, sit down for several months and learn how to pass the exams. So, in other words, it's almost like we are, we are, we are creating an alien group to rule over us. Among our own young people, we are giving them an alien a kind of uh, brainwashing to turn them, turn our young people into f thinkers of a western lens so that they can rule uh, to, uh, over us. And this is why the civil servants and civil society is so disconnected from the Aam Admi. Okay? So, uh, then, there, then there's a heading called Changing International Political Order. And again in that, I did not see China uh, uh, as a major force. It seems like this whole thing is quite obsolete. Sociology. Now, the sociology discipline curriculum, the first heading is what's the definition of the discipline? And it says, modernity and social changes in Europe and emergence of sociology. So, the very idea, the very discipline is basically modern based on social changes in Europe and these social changes in Europe led to the, uh, the rise of this new discipline called sociology. But if we are applying this sociology to understand our society, which is what the whole syllabus is trying to do, import this western thing to start understand Indian society. Uh, Surely, our ancestors and our heritage must have had ideas of who we are. We must have our own social ideas. Of, we must have our own social theories based on Indian traditional ideas. None of that is even in the definition. By definition, sociology is that which the Europeans developed as a result of their own experiences. Okay. Now, this will surprise you. A, B, C, D, E, F. These six are the only six in the list of social thinkers in the syllabus. So, you have Marx and you've got all these pretty well-known people, but there's nothing very sacrosanct about them. Even in the West, you would have a list which, which refutes them, defies them, argues against them. There are more modern people, uh, you know, they, this is all very classical, old-fashioned uh, social thinking. It seems that there is a certain cabal of old fashioned social thinkers in India who are trained in western theories. They are very proud and arrogant of what they know. They are trying to protect their turf, protect their reputation. They don't want to move on and they are hanging on to this syllabus and therefore we are sort of prisoners of that era. Now, I never thought sociology is a science. I mean sociology is sort of envious of natural sciences, but they like to call themselves social science as though they are a science. Uh, my problem is that no major change in society in recent times was predicted by social sciences or caused by social sciences. If you say society, society has changed because of internet, well social sciences didn't think of it, uh, they, they, they didn't cause it. In fact, they made fun of it. Until it's happened, now they are accepting it. If you say before that was social, uh, society changed because of media. Before that, women's revolution in the West because the birth control pill came and women were moving around, there was mobility and there was a, a lot of stuff in the equal rights amendment. None of that was anticipated by social scientists. It is not, a, a science is something that can, give, that gives you a model to predict outcomes. So, you have gravitation theory or you have theory of how high tide and low tide happen or how there is eclipses 
And if you apply the theory, you can predict what will happen, when it will happen and how it will happen. So if social sciences were a science, they should be able to predict with reasonable accuracy, but you, you do not have a track record of scientific uh, prediction capability in the so-called so social sciences. So it is basically ideology. It is just ideology, opinions, politics masquerading as science. So if you look at what they are teaching here, all these kind of topics, uh, you know, positivism and non-positivism and all that, you know, this is, this is a ploy to create an elitist jargon which the Aam Admi cannot argue against because the Aam Admi does not understand and to make the Aam Admi look like a fool if he says I do not understand it. So it is snob appeal and nothing else. Now under key concepts, uh, you look at the concepts they have. Uh, equality, inequality, hierarchy. So, what are the problems? What are the problems? This is what they want to study. The social sciences is to look for social problems in India through a western lens. So, then, then the next one is theories of social stratification. Again, Marx and Weber are the main ones that are brought in. And then the third one is social stratification of class, etc., etc., social mobility. So, while these are important issues, what bothers me is the very exclusive nature of imported social theories and the complete ignorance and elimination and rejection of Indian ideas of who we are as a society. That really bothers me. Now, this is an interesting one. This topic and I am by the way only telling you topics that are in the syllabus. That these are all topics with headings and numbered and all that from the syllabus. So, uh, how is work organized. How is work organized in different societies? So, it mentions three. There is a slave society. So, work is organized with you know slavery. Then there is a feudal society. Then there is an industrial capitalist society. Now, this is Marx coming up with you know how society evolves from 1 to 2 to 3. How about Jati as a system of organization of work? And why is not Jati there and studied as a system that was there a long time ago, it was very competitive, what went right, what went wrong, what are the dynamics, how the, how the colonial uh, intervention changed the Jati structure, where it is now, where it ought to go in the future. Why are not we able to create our models of how work was organized? After all, until about 250 years ago, India was a very competitive uh, labor, exceedingly industrious manufacturing people high amount of export, this has been documented by economists until the British messed it up in order to have their own industrial evolution to deindustrialize India. Until they did all that, India was uh, doing extremely well. So, how was it doing so well? How was China doing so well? It was not based on these kinds of models that the western society went through. We did not have to go through slavery, feudal, industrial. There was some kind of an Indian, uh, Indian system that was successful. Of course, we need to upgrade it, move forward, uh, find out what is wrong with it and keep becoming better which we, we have been doing and need to do. But you cannot completely ignore Indian models of how of, of the organization of work specialization of work because some of these jatis were highly specialized and world class in uh, what they achieved. And I, my friend uh, Vaidyanathan, Professor Vaidyanathan actually studies the relevance of this even today, the relevance of the Indian organization of work in today's competitive world. So, but the UPSC exam has no place for any Indian models. Now, when it comes to religion and society, uh, it is all sociological, uh, not uh, spiritual ideas of religion. It is sociological and since sociological studies are all western ideas of society and what was wrong with Christianity in Europe and how they had to reform it and do all those things. So, they are superimposing that on India. So, the idea, so they are saying types of religious practices and here they list animism, monism, pluralism, sects, cults. I do not think we study our uh, traditions in this way. This is not how we classify our traditions. We do not put them into these categories. So, you see our children are being told, told that we have to learn to fit into these categories. This is prescribed. If you want to get into the exam, that is what you got to learn. So, it is quite, quite a sad thing, uh, uh, you know, th then religion in modern society, again the topic of religion and science, secularization, etc., etc. I mean, uh, if you look in more details uh, than I am presenting here uh, in the syllabus, they ignore the positive role of our traditions, spiritual traditions in society, in family, individual development, mind management, you know all of that, health, 
it, it completely there is no such thing as role of Indian traditional uh, Indian spiritual traditions in health and yet the whole world is borrowing these traditions for the future of health models but we don't even have that as a topic so that's it's not that they have the topic but they don't do it properly they don't even have that topic now look at this how is the study of Indian society being done so Indology but they got some completely alienated view structural functionalism Marxist sociology now they got Indian names but the point is that these Indians are not practicing traditional people from uh, really uh, you know uh, our our background uh, some of them are okay uh, some of them a little bit uh, uh, you know more sympathetic I don't want I don't have the time to go through every one of them I'm not saying that everything they've written is wrong or I'm not criticizing that but I think that when you when you look at the study of Indian society you, you should do a purva paksha of western Indology and do and, and introduce Swadeshi Indology as a topic that uh, is, is worth studying and worth introducing in the in the topic study of Indian society. I don't think that these classical models are adequate for uh, future uh, you know civil servants. Uh, then then there is a topic called impact of colonial rule. Uh, in the impact of colonial rule, the focus is on social reforms. Okay, so you know, rather than how it destroyed society, it deindustrialized India. It did a divide and rule. It, it, uh, it created a devastated uh, you know forests forests were destroyed uh, how many of the arts were finished how language was finished off Sanskrit and so on rather than the impact of colonial rule in that way they have a little bit of that but look at the focus on social reforms the British were doing reforming our society our society had problems they came and reformed our society look at that so then there is this uh, a, a, a whole section called caste system so and these are you know mostly western models of caste you know uh, and what are the features of caste and untouchability and uh, you know all of that different forms so to to do well in your exam that's Indian society as you have to study and understand social classes now they list bunch of classes in India I would like them to introduce the anglicized, westernized, brown sahib and sepoy class. I think that's a fair thing to do. It would show, it would, it would be innovative, it would make the students reflect on themselves, their neighbors, their parents, the, the, the kind of media. We should be able to self-reflect as a sign of being an intelligent people. And uh, the, the elitist class which is alienated from Indianness is a class and social sciences should also study that. Okay, so this was my uh, high speed uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, going through all the, all the uh, humanities and social sciences uh, syllabus troubling things. There are things in it that uh, trouble me and I, I wanted, to, uh, wanted to talk about it. Now, I want to change uh, to a different topic. I'm done with the syllabus, that is item A on this chart. Now I want to illustrate B and C. To pass the exam, to pass the exam, you don't just read the syllabus and then pick your own books and start studying. Because you know, uh, when they say medieval period, whose idea of medieval period? Is it author A? Is it ideology B or C? Which, which version of medieval period? So what is happening is a certain sanctioned, authorized, official, sarkari, ideological writers. And these are these have not changed in the, since the new government came. These are still people from the old guard that are being studied. That's that's what the coaches, the coaching schools are teaching, because that's what students are being asked to learn, memorize, and put out in their exams. So the uh, the Hindu newspaper plays a very prominent role in this, because it is prescribed reading. It is prescribed officially by the coaches that you must learn how to read the Hindu newspaper and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, people who are bureaucrats who advise and give talks to young uh, uh, people on how to get in, they, uh, they recommend uh, the Hindu newspaper as one of the leading authorities on uh, this, the topics that they have to study from the syllabus. Now I'll show you a clip from a man called uh, Roman Saini. 
Uh, he is he himself got, did very well in this exam a few years back, and he started an online uh, coaching uh, business to teach young people. So watch this clip on on how to uh, study the uh, Hindu newspaper as an authority source on uh, information. Let's see the clip. Hey guys, what's up? Since many of you were facing problem in reading the Hindu, so I thought that I'll teach you the secrets how to read the Hindu in 90 minutes or less. So this is the YouTube channel and Academy and presented by me that is Dr. Roman Saini. First time I started reading Hindu, it took me three days to finish one Hindu. That is the <laughs> gravity it took and by the time I was finished, three more Hindus were there. So on that day I decided that I'll cut short the time but since then it has been a long journey and now I've been reading it for past four years. So now I know how to cut short the Hindu to 90 minutes or less which is relevant for UPSC. So obviously this is me, this series is conceptualized by me, you can read more about me on my Facebook page that is facebook.com slash my name romansani.official Please like it and message me your query there. I will reply within 24 hours. That's a personal guarantee, sir and ma'am. So let's begin the journey. And here we go. So certain myths before we start at all about this lecture. First thing, do not cut and paste any article. I've seen people taking scissors and cutting the article. See, this approach does not work. Why it does not work? Because at the end of the day, they are physical and they will tear off. Even if they do not tear off, you will not be able to no time to revise them. Is that understood? Do not subscribe to any other newspaper. Hindu khatam hoga ni. Dusra padoge kaise? The Hindu will not be finished, sir and ma'am. So how can you start another newspaper? Then do not subscribe to any financial newspaper like Economic Times or Financial Express. It is not needed at all. It is not needed at all. Then do not, please do not make huge notes from it. If you do want to make notes, just write key phrases and keywords and facts from the article. That's it. That is the only requirement we have. Then if you really fall in love with a particular article, I want you to bookmark it. If you do not know how to bookmark, see my video, how to use internet to make better videos. No, internet to prepare better for civil services, please wake up. Okay, I couldn't believe it when I saw this. I mean, it, is this the caliber of uh, the elite uh, government servants, the, the people who will be foreign ambassadors and foreign diplomats, and uh, you know cabinet secretaries and things like that ruling the country in it's such an enormous country such a great country and a great civilization is this the iq and the kind of personality and communication skills this is one of the brilliant uh, persons who got through the exam and is now a coach so he's making a lot of money coaching many other people and there's several other coaches similar to that i'll i'll feature a few of them so now in another clip so this just shows how important is the Hindu newspaper to these people. And in another clip, the same guy says that uh, his favorite book on uh, Indian history for the history exam is called A Brief History of Modern India by Rajiv Ahir. Now I went and downloaded some 250, 300 page PDF of that book to look through some parts of it. And I couldn't go through more than uh, the first, you know, few page, 30, 40 pages. It was just quite ridiculous. I'll tell you a few things, I'll quote a few things in that book. And that's the book being taught, okay? So it says that uh, in the 19th century, uh, Indian society was caught in a vicious web of religious superstitions and social obscurantism. Because Hinduism had become a compound, Hinduism had become a compound of magic, animism and superstition. The priests were oh, very, very powerful, had an had a unhealthy influence uh, because idolatry and polytheism helped to reinforce their position. Idolatry and polytheism, uh, you know, so he's arguing for kind of monotheism and uh, no image worship. Why? Who is he to say that? And why is that required for, why will that get you through? Why can't I say I worship images and I worship the divine in many forms? Why is that a problem? Why is that superstition? Whereas if I say that uh, Moses parted the ocean, that is considered very scientific, which is of course ridiculous. Or if I say something, some claim from the Quran or Bible or whatever, which has nothing to do with science at all, why isn't that superstition? Why is it that our ideas are measured by a gold standard, by a yardstick which is alien to us and, and we are criticized and that's what our people are being taught. So it bothers me. Then he says social conditions were equally depressing. So it is not just religion but social conditions and it had to do with the position of women and their marriage 
and uh, you know a lot uh, it was common to kill female infants and then there was sati husbands when husbands died they were expected to commit sati expected which is very strange because you know sati was very localized first of all in very small part of india uh, and for very specific reasons and to say that all over india this was expected you know i mean i don't know how you could be more ridiculous than that but this is taught as standard truth to become a civil servant and then he talks about caste and the interesting thing he says in modern times caste became a major obstacle in the spread of democracy actually even the worst critics of caste say that caste groups vote banks facilitated a certain period of democracy okay from congress uh, centric to bjp centric uh, the uh, the advancement the evolution or whatever you want to call it the progression of democracy happened with a huge number of caste groups you may agree with the with it was a good idea or you may say it is not a good idea but you cannot say that it held back democracy certainly democracy was not was thriving uh, in spite of these caste groups because caste groups brought people into democracy through their own group so this guy is the, the person who wrote this book is quite ridiculous and yet this is the favorite book to be taught uh, for this kind of an exam now in this book ram mohan roy is presented as the big hero he is fighting against court superstition and idol worship and evil hindu practices like sati that's what the why ramon roy is great it doesn't mention the book doesn't mention that Ra, Ra, ramon roy was the person who wrote to the british in london asking that they bring in the anglicized education system and the english language which is what macaulay did so while we hate macaulay we forget that macaulay did not come up with the idea macaulay responded to a request by ramon roy so all you guys who are anti macaulay should actually take on the uh, really go after ram mohan roy and stop calling him raja that was a title the british gave him i mean he was actually quite a quite a super sepoy type of person uh, that the british of course uh, praised because uh, he was uh, you know he was peddling their line he was peddling their line then there is this uh, uh, it talks about the, it praises the book i'm talking about the book also uh, still it praises the british for emancipating indian women by christians opening up educational institutions because you know poor indians didn't have didn't know anything about educating women so the christians came and did that so that's that's why this uh, book is recommended now i want to shift i want to shift to uh, a, a, a couple of people that you will recognize some of you will recognize because many of you recognize ananya vajpayee and and she is a very popular author that they want to uh, teach uh, in, in 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 you know in these uh, uh, coaching classes so ananya vajpayee because uh, they i'll be showing you video clips of uh, how her articles her writings her articles in the hindu uh, are considered the you know the material that students should learn in order to pass the exam i want to give you a little background uh, she's married to uh, basharat B- peer uh, who is a self acknowledged kashmir separatist he he is very open about it so i'm not putting i'm not sort of judging him unfairly this is his view and he's very open and very proud about it he has serious problems about what he calls the indian occupation of kashmir that's her husband and on the right side of this image is her mentor sheldon palak and if you want to know more about it there's a lot of videos we have a lot of uh, conferences we've done a uh, book i've written the battle for sanskrit which talks about it how this group of people have taken over control of sanskrit studies in the west and they have uh, created an army of people who think like them in india they were on the verge of taking over shingeri mutt uh, they got uh, he got uh, padam shri from the indian government all of that kind of stuff and murthy narayan murthy of infosys fame uh, has m- selected him as editor in chief to edit uh, uh, translate uh, hundreds of volumes 500 volumes of uh, ancient indian texts so obviously this is a very powerful group okay so she is a product ananya vajpay who uh, you will see in this uh, uh, clip uh, uh, being taught her articles being taught uh, she is a very powerful person and so and you and the article one of her recent articles that they are teaching for the uh, civil services exam uh, is a very one sided view a very one sided view of sheldon pollock okay so i want you to first watch it so let's let's play this clip hello students welcome to the class on editorial decode and in this class i will be decoding 
Why Sheldon Pollock Matters, written by Ananya Vajpai. Now, from examination point of view, this will help you in general studies, mains examination paper 2. Plus, this is important for public administration and sociology optional students. Now, what is this editorial about? This editorial is about how the idea of nationalism, how the idea of right to freedom of speech and expression and how the idea of liberty and how the idea of liberalism is getting challenged. This editorial is also about how we need to revive our ingenuity, how we need to resurrect our ideology in the context of liberalism that has unfolded since the era of renaissance and reformation now in order to understand this editorial first of all we need to know about what is the importance of liberty and what is the importance of right to freedom of speech and expression the right to freedom of speech and expression it offers the mankind to bear his mind it offers an opportunity to the humanity to progress. It provides a kind of a pedestal which helps the mankind to gorge the far off horizons. Now, this right to freedom of speech and expression, it helps to challenge something that is wrong something that is bad something that is causing the dissuadation towards progress towards egalitarian society towards utopia now in this editorial author ananya vajpayee has highlighted how the forces of fundamentalism how the forces that are antithetical to liberty for the forces that don't want the freedom of speech of expression and liberty to challenge their stances to challenge their hegemonizing positions now this right to freedom of speech and expression it helps in the advancement it helps in the progress of the civilizations now without this right there would be no progress there would be no civilizational growth there will be no inventions there will be no experimentation there will be no critical analysis there will be no pondering over the novice that would be in existence in the days to come now in this editorial the author has highlighted about how Pollock this Sheldon Pollock who is heading up an institution that has been set to decode the vast knowledge and to convert that vast knowledge, the classical vast knowledge, into English so that the people can understand the gold mine of the intellect that the Indians possess. And this very person, Sheldon Pollock, he has done a phenomenal job in decoding, in unearthing and in unwinding this substantive substance but his position that he is holding on to is being challenged by the forces that don't want persons like him to sustain because he has taken up a stance which is against the BJP government. He has taken up a stance which is 
against the ideology of the BGP party. Now what is that ideology? The ideology of Hindu, Hindustan and Hindi. Now this author, Mr. Pollock, he wants to create a society where there is no fear. He wants to entrench a society which is based on the real substance, which is based on the truth, which is based on the virtues, which is based on the liberty of mankind, and which can help the entire human race to understand the true nitty gritties. And by doing this, he is actually trying to counter the forces of majoritarianism. And this majoritarianism is challenging the minoritism. And this is something that he is trying to dissuade, this is something he is trying to stop. So this is what this editorial is about. This editorial is more about the qualities, the work that Mr. Pollock has done. He is a great authority on the works specifically related to Sanskrit language. So this is all for the editorial decode. You can subscribe to this channel, name of channel is EIS Mentors. You can contact me at 845 in case you're interested in buying the video classes and entire civil services preparation. And in order to wield the information of the class that we are offering, please visit our websites eismentors.com and brainwiki.com. And in case you like this video, do click on the like button, do share and comment on this video. So this was all for the day. Bye bye. Take care. Have a nice, nice day. Okay, that's a long one. But you see, what a shallow thing. It didn't, he didn't even read the editorial and summarize her points. It's all ideological outburst. And this is considered knowledge. Even the Hindu called it op-ed. It's an opinion. It's not knowledge. It's opinion. Opinion is different than knowledge. You sit for an exam on knowledge. Everybody has an opinion. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with somebody has different opinion and so on. But you cannot take opinions of people no matter how important and how politically savvy and all that. You cannot take them and substitute for knowledge. And this is being presented, Anyanaya Vajpayee's articles in, in the Hindu are being presented as knowledge about Indian society, current affairs and being taught by stupid people like this. But these people are the ones who do very well in the exams and therefore they become uh, teachers for the next generation of students. So this what you just heard is, is a formal lesson for students entering the civil services exam. This is how they are coached. This is what they are supposed to remember. Now, if you heard this, it, it, you wouldn't really have to know a whole lot about Sheldon Pollock's real work. You don't have to read anything about him. You wouldn't even have to read the editorial of Ananya Vajpayee or Neo, know anything about her. You just need to know right wing, left wing, majoritarianism, minoritarianism, bunch of buzzwords, branding and all that kind of stuff. And that's why we have a moron youth. Because that this is the role model of what the youth are supposed to become like. Now, I read this article. In fact, I have responded to it. I wanted to respond to it in the Hindu. They blocked me. They refused me to write back, even though she wrote many, many articles, some of them naming me. But I was not allowed to respond to this issue, which I have studied in great detail. So I will tell you, in this article, she says that she supports Pollock for the following reason. First, uh, all his critics are not certified as scholars by their own cabal, by her cabal. So since her cabal gets to certify who is a scholar and who is not, and they have not certified any of us as scholars, therefore, therefore uh, uh, we don't count and he must be right. Second is, he signed petitions supporting the Ghar, Ghar Wapsi leftists who returned awards. Then he signed a petition supporting the JNU student rebellion. He, he voiced uh, his views against the Babri de demolition in 90, back in 92. He has been a very active uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of person based in the U.S. against uh, Hindus. Uh, he has been a vocal critic of Modi and the Sangh Parivar, uh, signed a petition not to get him the visa, all of those things. These are the reasons she gives in her article that he is supposedly teaching about. Uh, and then uh, Ananya Vajpayee calls Pollock an intellectual's intellectual. Pollock is an intellectual's intellectual. So, by implication, she is the intellectual, 
and he's her intellectual. That's the, the assumption. And at the end of the article, she signs herself as a student of Pollock for eight years in Chicago while getting her PhD. Must have taken a very long time getting her PhD, eight years. But anyway, that's not, uh, that's besides the point. And of course, praises him for all the awards Sonia Gandhi gave him. So her reasons, he doesn't even capture. Yeah. So this is, this is the sloppy state of affairs uh, uh, of uh, education in our country that this kind of brainwashing goes. It, uh, students throng to get this kind of education and the reason they get it is because it helps them get through exams otherwise they wouldn't be taking these kind of courses. So um, I want to uh, show you a different clip also on uh, from a different uh, coach. So you get a different spin on how many different people are teaching about Ananya Vajpayee. So let's look at the following clip. Now coming to the MCLI issue. The MCLI is a Murthy funded, um, the son of Narayana Murthy funded um, Murthy Classical Library of India. So this Murthy Classical Library the, funded by Mr. Rohan Murthy, the objective is to develop an uh, English translation for all the classical texts um, and publish them with the proper analysis. So this objective is very laudable as it tries to bring in uh, an exposure to the ancient knowledge of India. So in this context, um, the person who is heading this is Sheldon Pollock, the professor at uh, Columbia University. So the government of the day and RSS has certain objections to him to continue as the chair of this particular work. So we don't need to get into all those things. Um, we can use this MCLI as an example towards protecting our traditional knowledge, our classical, our cultural heritage. So that was a, that was a different coach saying the same thing. It's a prashasti for Sheldon Pollock. He hasn't read any of those works. He is in no position to even read and understand what they are saying. Probably he's not educated enough. But he's been hired, paid, uh, sponsored by the Hindus, sponsored by this cabal, whoever is doing it. Uh, the point is he's, he's just basically giving you a what is politically correct agenda. This is what the students should be parroting. And they don't need to know details. So this explains why, you know, in India, I'm quite fed up. Uh, so many times I'm trying to reason with a person. And it's not whether I agree or disagree. I just want to see some logic. I want to reason, argue with them from a reasonable point of view. I want to understand their logic, give them my logic. And I'm frustrated that they don't have logical skills. They cannot think for themselves. They are not even interested in thinking. They just want to, have, they have one-liners, they have positions, and they want to parrot it out. I am reminded of a talk, two, two nights of talks I gave in uh, India International Center uh, in uh, uh, the winter of 2005, two, two consecutive nights, long, two hour each, followed by Q&A and the videos are on, my, on our website. I remember I gave this talk and there was a very vibrant uh, discussion, at the end of which a young woman came to me and said, you know, I am very interested, very impressive. I want to invite you. I'm from JNU. Uh, she was a graduate student, and uh, I want one of our professors to approach you. Would you be interested, and so on? So I said, of course, just give me some details, and I will talk about it. Next night, she comes for my second part of the lecture, and she says, you know, my professor wanted to know. I could not. I told her all that I heard from you, but then he asked me, are you left wing or right wing? I could not understand. So, are you left wing or right wing, sir? See, that's how stupid, moronic, mediocre our people are. These are from prestigious colleges, okay? And these are people who are going to rule the country. And that's, that's the level of education we have in our country. People just waiting to be fed what they'll memorize. They don't need to understand. Nobody expects them to understand. They just print it out in you know, an exam and get through. That's how a large number of our young people are. So I, uh, uh, I also want to tell you that... Uh, there are so many articles of Ananya Vajpayee that have been analyzed for the uh, IS exam. The, here is one called Hindu Swaraj versus Hindu Rashtra. And she did this in the Hindu uh, and a, an organization called XAAM.org. This is exam. This is an exam organization, another one of them. They put it on their website and uh, for analysis. And they are saying Hindutva is a historic and possibly doomed attempt to change everything. This is the first line. Okay. So this is for Ananya Vajpayee's ideas that they are uh, explaining. 
intellectuals and opinion leaders who have leaders who have professed particular beliefs and held certain positions for the longest time appear now to be changing their views this is an anavaj by very scared that uh, in uh, 2014 lot of people who had opinions for a very long time are changing those views so this bothers them and this is why she's uh, she's turning to these articles then she says neither the congress nor the left seem any longer to be conversant with or proud of the left liberal political traditions that dominated indian politics and this drives the final nail into the coffin of secular opinion so what she's saying is that it is left politics which equates to secularism as if there is no other kind of pluralism possible it's only the left wing that can have a claim to secularism so you know you would expect that a good coach will analyze the opeds will say here is one opinion what are some alternative opinions what are your opinions let's teach you how to think how to analyze that's how education is in the united states i must say i mean i may have many other issues but the education system teaches you to think from the school onwards you are required to think on your own and i find that indian youth rather than encouraging them to have a mind of their own they basically fed with dogma of one kind or the other kind and i'm showing you examples of that there's a heading in this article the heading is the problem with hindutva so it's not even claiming to be neutral or objective it's claiming to just it's it's clearly explaining a particular ideological point of view nothing wrong with ideological points of view but they ought to be balanced by both sides okay so i now want to uh, 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 show you a, 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 a go to a different author now audrey truske is in the united states uh she's finished her phd and uh, she's a student of uh, sheldon pollock and uh, wendy doniger uh and she teaches uh, indian languages and hinduism and indian history to uh mostly nri kids who don't know what they are being fed uh and she's a great fan of aurangzeb uh, she's written a lot of books on aurangzeb and she's defending aurangzeb she's defending the mughals they were great patrons of sanskrit it was not their fault it was the fault of hindus and things of that sort and she's very fond of aurangzeb now uh, the the uh, an article uh, which is very popular uh, among the uh, ias exam coaching the uh, civ- civil service exam coaching going on that I to- i'm talking about is an article uh, called uh, she wrote uh, called uh, in in a, on a blog site called xaam.org okay uh, that exam.org aurangzeb is a severely misunderstood figure and this is a reprint from the hindu again it's a reprint from the hindu and so she uh, they introduce her very proudly she's stanford university uh, she argues forcefully in acknowledging india's diversity and india's greatness so all this makes it look like wow you know she's one of our friends um and then it says bharatiya janata party government believes mughals are not part of india's history i don't know if they believe that mughals are not part of india's history i thought they believe that mughals are part of india's destruction so they are part of history i mean they they destroyed a lot they destroyed universities not a single new university came up india's economy didn't increase its production it went down uh, so much uh, the indian language was replaced by persian as the state language official court language so many things of that sort happened and today we are paying the price of what the mughals created you know in in a, in a sense so i don't think uh, i would say that they are not part of our history i would say that they are a part of the dark ages of our history in some sense so uh, th- then she says sanskrit flourished in the royal mughal court okay and then she gives a lot of some details however we should not make the error of attributing aurangzeb's lack of sanskrit to his alleged bigotry uh, aurangzeb is a severely misunderstood historical figure who has suffered perhaps more than any other mughal ruler so she thinks that we we are unfair to aurangzeb is actually a great guy uh, and and so on and so forth i don't have time to go and analyze all of these all i wanted to give you some sample that this is the kind of ideological leaning of uh, writers who are selected and taught to the ias aspirants and then these people go and regurgitate that now these coaches coaching uh, classes for ias cost a lot of money and some of them require you to spend 4 hours a day uh, for 6 7 months so it's not like one or two lessons like the ones i just showed you you go through a prolonged period of learning and you are brainwashed because you're going to get all this kind of stuff uh, and the reason this is the coaching going on 
is because this is what the syllabus accepts you, uh, expects you to learn. Okay. So, just to recap one more time, uh, the, between the civil service exam at the top of the slide and the applicants at the bottom of the slide, we have a problematic syllabus, uh, we have ideological writers, I gave you some samples and we have coaching schools who are doing this kind of work. Another, uh, another a very important uh, uh, publication I did not talk about is the Economic and Political Weekly, the EPW, uh, which is also considered a must read. Uh, civil servants, uh, you know, swear by it, uh, and these coaching people also, and that's also a bastion of the left. EPW, by the way, is published by some some group called uh, Samiksha Trust, and they have people like Ramila Thapar as board members. So you know what what kind of ideology they have. Yeah. So uh, in uh, in a nutshell, what I'm saying is that the old left has a stranglehold on the civil services through the gateway by which people enter. The entrance gate, the chaukidars at the entrance gate are these guys. There is certain kind of ideology which is at the entrance gate, you do not get in unless you pass these chaukidars and you pass them after showing them that you are a certain point, you have a certain ideology that they can accept. It is a disgrace and a shame that so many, three years have gone or some, a lot of time has gone since the new government came, promised all kinds of things, but this has not changed. It is not even part of the debate to decolonize. We have so many, I talked about decolonizing and intellectual kshatriyas and what are the problems with all the western influences and what not, I have been writing and so after I write something new, uh, within 6 months to a year many people start copying that same idea and so now there is a lot of these decolonizing manthans and uh, conclaves and uh, you know events going on, but why has nobody? when they talk about decolonizing the Indian mind, why has nobody made a case study of the civil services exam and the civil services in general? The, they, they have training institutes after you get into the civil services, they have training institutes to give you some indoctrination which are also like that. So, why has, why is it that uh, you know somebody has to uh, discover this, educate our people, why aren't so many of our prominent speakers? who think they are intellectuals and activists and so on, why aren't they doing all this kind of work? And, and, and so, this is a challenge I have, why, why wait for me or somebody like me to bring this to your attention, why aren't more people in the decolonizing business or decolonizing dhanda going around giving talks, getting funds for conferences and so on, why aren't they raising this issue? So, I am hoping that uh, as a result of uh, this uh, intense discussion I have had today and it had to be intense because our, our young people go through a very intense period to learn all this, then they have a very serious career ambition and in that career ambition they are carrying this baggage of this kind of an ideology. Uh, I have had this uh, 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 intention to get this point across to you in a forceful way, but I am hoping as a result of this, a lot of our people who had it with this old system and who keep uh, regurgitating buzzwords like let's decolonize and all that. I hope they'll actually start looking at specific institutions. Look at the civil services as an institution, as a range of institutions and look for things that are not friendly to our Vedic heritage. And you will be surprised, you, it's not only NCRT books, it's not only media, okay? it's not only church and evangelism and all those things. It is things like this in the heart of our government, including the government, the new government. So I will leave you with that. Uh, please uh, write back to me. Please post comments on uh, where the videos are posted because I'd like to generate a healthy discussion. And I'll come back to. You, I'll respond to those comments. And hopefully in a few days I'll come back with a with a sequel to this. Thank you very much. Namaskar.